Hey friends, I thought I would introduce this, um, what I'm reading this week, although it's going to be a bit more vlog style, like, but like how it used to be because I'm not sure if you can see the surroundings, but I'm not in Amsterdam anymore. I am in London, at, this is at my friend's place, and I'm going to a couple of other friend's places, and I'm also going down to Margate, um, to have some quasi friend time this Christmas, but I am planning to do a lot of reading. My eye is also streaming for the first time I've worn mascara in like a month but today I'm at it's a work day actually I'm just doing some computer stuff and then I've got a photo shoot for a work project which is really exciting um very random but um the contents of the work project won't come out I think like the start of the new year or maybe like the like January February time next year so I'm just waiting for the photographer at my friend's house I'm gonna do that and then I thought I'd tell you what I'm reading and what I packed so I am reading Strager by Johan Leikholm. It's translated from, I'm going to say the Norwegian. And I really enjoyed it because I read, I really enjoyed this bit. Yeah, it's from the Norwegian. Because the author um, translated the translator's book. So the author, um, Johan, this book is translated by Saskia Vogel and then Saskia... Vogel's book Permission was translated by Johan in 2019. I just think that I just loved that. I thought that was so cool. Um, I think spe specifically in like European languages or Scandinavian languages that aren't necessarily like hugely widely spoken, I think there's definitely like a symbiosis between that being quite a small literary community. And I thought that was a really nice tidbit I read when I was looking through the back. But anyway, this is quite a strange story of a Alpine town, Strega, where there is a dilapidated, like, yet to be restored to its former glory hotel called Olympic that employs a group of seasonal young women to be like workers, maids, housekeepers, that kind of thing, but they're not working for any guests. They're sort of performing their tasks to no one. And then I'm about, I'm over halfway through and we've only just reached the sort of the twist the plot point which is actually revealed in the back of the book anyway but to understand that the someone is something goes wrong someone is murdered and then we step back to find out sort of why that happened and why it was like on the one night that the hotel came to life and sort of the repercussions of that i wouldn't say i'm blown away so far but i am enjoying it i am enjoying the language there's lots of short tidbits of um like single one-liners that i really enjoyed I looked up at the ceiling where rud mould was spreading around me, the others were sunken in a communal sleep. I love that phrase of communal sleep, like talking about the dormitories. Um, it's like slightly odd, slightly off kilter, but I'm not sure it's going to come to fruition for me. Um, but we will see because perhaps there's another twist yet to come. But that's Strager. And then in terms of physical other books, I packed Haunted Houses by Lynn Tillman. I really wanted to pack paperbacks just for the sake of my suitcase. Um, which you saw me haul quite recently and I thought this sounds like the kind of book I would want to dip in and out with on the sofa with my friends sort of just like easy reading while other people might be watching telly or just before I go to bed um and the thing I'm loving about this is that they're, they're really short chapters so they're perfect for dipping in and out of I was going to bring a short story collection but I have read quite a few recently and I wasn't none that were on my shelves were taking my fancy so that's that one. And then I bought Bodywork, The Radical Power of Personal Narrative by Melissa Phoebos. I started this a while ago and I was emailing my friend Sage about it because they're also a writer and we were talking about sort of personal narrative, trauma dumping, um, how to navigate sharing your personal story um, as your job. And she said, sharing your personal story is like part of your work. And they were saying that they found this really useful and I did start it and then I put it down for no other reason that I was distracted by something else but I think this would be a good book to read over the Christmas break when I'm not necessarily like actively working but I can be thinking about sort of the year to come and stuff I'm really annoyed that my eye oh my goodness have I had this on my eye the whole time no guys I'm not gonna record and then I'm listening to Raven Smith's Men which is Raven Smith's second essay collection. I really enjoyed Trivial Pursuits, which was his first one. I also consumed it on audio. I will say his voice sounds a lot different to this audio one. Something about the idiosyncrasies of like his voice rhythm is quite disconcerting to me. Let me know if anyone else has listened to it and think that it sounds sort of strange, like 
yeah, I don't know, it doesn't, the, the speech doesn't sound as natural for some reason. I really loved the audio of the first one. I do actually have a physical copy of this, but I just lent it to my friend Siska. But this is about the men in his life in terms of romantic relationships, his father, men in general, masculinity, from his point of view as a um, cis gay brown man. So it talks a lot about his upbringing and he, he's really funny and um, self-evasive and at the same time can be quite earnest. He wrote he wrote this chapter on love and sort of how he like talk, his, he's friends with Dolly Alderson who talks about like how her work is so beautiful and so saccharine in a way that he enjoys but would never be him. But then the chapter that follows it is the story of his marriage and uh, his his love for his husband and it's so interesting because he's like I feel sick writing this but it is true and I loved the way he talked about the endurance of their relationship and like marriage is this journey and almost this this sense of fate of like two people who just happen to be growing alongside each other and growing together instead of apart and like what a joyful experience that can be to be 10 years into a relationship both being entirely different people but at the same time equally as close as you've always been and yeah I just loved the way he wrote about romance in that sense and then he has the same as he did in Trivial Pursuits those party boy stories the escapades to New York the um you know the theories about if you're a hot person or a funny person and you, you can't be both and stuff like that which I really enjoy like it's very funny it's very British in its humour um and it's not necessarily like a super critical evaluation of men but it is really interesting in his ideas you know he sort of weaves in the conversation around gender in terms of like sports at school or um like being closeted and like those conversations that are related to his experience as a man but not necessarily blanket statements about like all men are which um i think at this point we're past that sociological analysis of things because it, it's very trite and you know lacks nuance to just say men are trash so i think it is really interesting in that sense and funny and that he wrote a good chapter also about his earlier life and like his early adult working life and working in like fashion adjacent businesses and sort of the perpetuation of fat phobia and his um sort of how susceptible he was to diet culture and how he remains to be and i really enjoyed his honesty when he was talking about wellness and yeah, I don't know, it was really interesting when he was saying, he's basically was talking about how you have these diet rules that lots, perhaps you don't if you're watching, but like I know it's the same, the way he spoke about it was it really resonated with me, where you have these diet rules where you don't know where they came from, but they like really stick in your mind and they're like a rule that's been created that you can't break. Like he was talking about how someone once told him that an egg is like a multivitamin, so then he got obsessed with eating eggs. And like even now when he eats an egg, he's like, oh, this is so healthy, I'm eating an egg and how um you know you shouldn't eat bread twice a day and he's like even though i don't believe in that and like i'm not that um wedded to thinness and those things anymore those things sort of you know they stay in the back of your mind and i i thought that was notable particularly from his perspective as a man and then obviously working in fashion adjacent businesses and he sort of says that there is no we never left diet culture behind we're not post um perfectionism for size zero and like that still is perpetuating which is, is certainly true um and yeah from a male perspective it was interesting to hear him speak on that so that is what I'm listening to on audio and then I'm also reading Jesus and John Wayne which is a semi like it's like borders non-mainstream non-fiction slash academic text um that is about the evangelical far right and the like last 100 years of their movement towards um, political sort of their political progress in terms of how they rallied the right to be this large voting block and the religious gr groups to be a far right voting block and I'm really enjoying that but I realise that's quite a niche one to enjoy. So that's what I'm reading. I'm not sure if I'm going to catch up with you before I get back to Amsterdam, but hopefully you enjoy a few clips of various British landscapes and lovely dinners, etc, etc. And I'll see you guys a bit later. Thank you.
Oh yeah, I remember me and Jenny Park. Yeah, the student places, people just really nice. Very nice. This is Shaggy Bay. It was a uh, yeah, 2005 from the Weird Bookshop. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, let me show you my. this video but for me i just got back from margate with my friends and we had the most wonderful time would definitely recommend if you've never visited that part of the uk please don't mind my nails they're actually looking vile um it was so wonderful to visit in off season i really enjoyed it i didn't get to swim sadly because my sinuses are really inflamed and i just thought even though in my heart i wanted to do cold water swimming i just knew it would make me more unwell so unfortunately i did not manage to dip in the sea but i did manage lots of other Wonderful things in Margate, just mostly eating and drinking, like the restaurants there are phenomenal. So if you're thinking about going to Margate, I don't think I documented it very well in the last few clips because I was went with a wonderful friend of mine and their boyfriend and Tom and I hadn't spent much time with like them as a couple. Ellie is my friend for a really long time, but her boyfriend's quite new in her life and so therefore in ours. Um, so I didn't want to like film and like, you know, do stuff like that in front of other people. But we had a wonderful time and it was like so lovely to spend time with, like extended periods of time with friends. It's like even before we went to Margate, I just, um, yeah, I feel like I've had some really good quality time with um, some of my friendships and, you know, really reflecting on how many of these people, particularly like women in my life, have been there for so long and like, we were all sitting around a dinner party on Saturday night and sort of lamenting over how it's crazy that we've all grown into such different people but we all managed to be still like so in tune with each other and how yeah just made me so appreciative this trip of like um my friends and getting to spend like longer than just an evening or just a lunch with them which is normally how it is when I come back to the UK you're just like dotting around loads of different people and I think actually I prefer seeing less people but seeing people for like longer and more yeah prolonged and like deeper periods of time so that was that but i have acquired quite a few things even though i am on a book buying ban <laughs> but i thought i would show them to you because who doesn't want to see books you know it's christmas time i have a few non-bookish things to show you firstly the coolest mittens i will ever own if you know anything about me or my mum you'll know that we love the moomins deeply and my best friend Cisco got me these mittens with little my on them Lil Mai is one of my favourite Moomin characters. I kind of want to get a tattoo of her because I think she's so sassy and cute. But um, yeah, this was my Christmas present from Siska. And they're like beautiful, warm, fleecy on the inside mittens. And I hate gloves, but I love mittens. And she knows me so well. So that is a non-bookish thing I got. And then the only other thing I want to show you was some prints we got at Margate, made by Margate. It was like, I think it might have been a pop-up, but it was a like print shops selling like loads of independent things from different margate creative there's such a huge art scene down in margate uh, the turner galleries there tracy emmond has a long history there so there's just like a real buzz for people making and doing cool stuff which was obviously really fun and my friend i went with is super into art as well so we had a great time we both picked up some prints i picked up this one by someone called colorbox studio they were so well priced this was eight quid it's fucking weird and I'm sure loads of people probably think it's horrible but it really made me and my friend laugh and it reminds me of David Trigley if you know his work so that's that one and then I think I might give this to a friend but I don't think they watch the videos this is a design by someone called Maddie Vine their Instagram is Maddieology M-A-D-D-Y-O-L-G-Y and this is one of their inkling drawings 
each design was originally hand painted with three colours of ink and digitally printed onto recycled paper. And it has like this miffy type figure, like looking really cold and chilly. And they were both eight quid and I thought that was such a good deal. My friend bought some really cool stuff in that shop as well. And yeah, just in general, we loved Margate. We went to the bookshop there and we picked up, Tom picked up two things, but I'm going to show you them. It's just called the Margate Bookshop. Um, and it was super, super cool, like really lovely stuff, wonderful selection, great curation, like a really satisfying selection of literary fiction, like new, interesting non-fiction, lots of indie um, publishers. And yeah, we adored it. Tom bought this for my mum as part of her Christmas present. It's called Hotel Splendid by Ludwig Bell, Bem Elmans, Bellemans. We weren't looking for this. We were looking for A Waiter in Paris, which is like a book that came out earlier this year. It's like quite a thick hardback all about like waiting staff in, 1950 pa in 1950s Paris. My mum loves to read books about hotels. This isn't just like a random thing, but the um, bookseller suggested this one, which is set in 1920s New York, um, Hotel Splendid. It's a classic memoir where Ludwig encounters eccentricity on every level of the hotel hierarchy. He works his way up from bus boil to the at the restaurant's most undesirable table to assistant manager of the private banquets, Russian ballerinas, Wall Street tycoons, and then the world's worst waiter to contend with, a murder plot against Monsieur Victor, the authoritarian maitre d' to solve. And then it's got his own illustrations, like accompanying the book, and it's very like kitsch, I think. I'm I'm not 100% sure if she's gonna love it because she does have quite a radar for things that she finds cringe, so. I'm not sure if she'll find it that so, but she does also love oldie worldy hotel culture. So who knows, it's out with Pushkin Press and it wasn't one we were looking for, but I think she will still enjoy it. And then Tom bought me a copy of Claire Keegan's Foster, which was very sweet. And it's this tiny little um, novella um, set in Ireland, but this time in the summer. And it says it's a hot summer in rural Ireland. A child is taken by her father to live with relatives on the farm, not knowing when, if she will be brought home again. In the Kinsella's house, she finds affection and warmth she's never known, and then she begins to blossom. But something unspoken happens in the new household, and the summer must come to an end. I recently read from my book club in Amsterdam, Small Things by These by Claire Keegan, and I really enjoyed it, and I loved the satisfaction of reading something short in one go, and I hadn't done that in ages. So when I saw this one, and it was set in the summer, I thought this is perfect. I will read this um, on an upcoming trip and devour it, and then also lend it to my mum because she loved um, Keegan's other book as well. So that's what I got from Margate Bookshop. Oh no, I picked up one more book for my Tom bought me out one. I got this one for myself and I've been, I know I break my book brand for this because I have been desperate to buy it since it came out in, I think early November. I spoke about it on my channel before and Sam Johnson Sklee is Rebecca Johnson's husband and Rebecca Johnson's one of my internet friends who wrote Small Fires, which is one of my favorite books I read this year. And this is Sam's contribution to their household literary scene which i just think is so cool that they've both written and published books this year this is living rooms i spoke about it in a radar video and it's a set of essays about or like one extended essay about sort of domesticity and the culture of interior design over the ages and how that we can use the way we decorate and live in our homes as this sort of microscope to understand how we're living through wider society and culture um so it says it moves between the colonial trade in house plants, Proustian reminiscence and razor sharp critique of rentier capitalism. It suggests by looking closely at the places where we live, we can confront political realities that extend out into our world. In the way we furnish our homes, might we be unconsciously imagining a different kind of life? So yeah, as you guys may know about me, I love interiors. Um, it's a job I used to have and something I still pursue as a hobby and I'm very interested in the aesthetics of the way like people live so I know I'm gonna love this so much and underline it I might even read it on the train home to Amsterdam on Christmas Eve and just like devour it on that four hour journey so that is what I bought um at the Margate bookshop and then I came home as in back to my mum's house and there's a few proofs waiting for me that I am excited about i got an advanced copy of polly barton's new book which is out in march i'm super excited for it's a chunky one and it's porn and oral history this is definitely like a left turn from what i expected polly barton to be publishing next but nonetheless i'm really excited and trust her to be um insightful and empathetic and well thought out conversations around something that's definitely taboo um and it says it's a thrilling, thought-provoking, revelatory, revealing, joyfully informative, informal exploration of a, a, a subject that has always retained its element of taboo. Um, to be self-explanatory given the title, have been let down with a few essays and think pieces I've read about this particular taboo 
I'm thinking specifically of the right to sex. I really didn't think that essay important there was up to much. So I'm hoping this more extended version of the topic will bring me some satisfaction. I also had a proof of Losing the Plot by Jericho Wusu, which I already read online. Like I also got a digital proof, but they had sent me this one as well. And I also bought a copy because I loved it so much. So I definitely will be lending my physical copy out to friends and then keeping this one on my bookshelf, which is very kind. And then finally, I got a copy of, um, the publisher reached out to me and asked me if I wanted this one. It's out with Picador in May and it's called Is This Okay by Harriet Gibson. That all sounded interesting to me. It said, music journalist, self professed creep and former winner of the coveted Fittest Girl in Year 11 award. Gibson has been living, lives in fear of her internet searches being leaked. Um, so I think it also deals with chronic illness. And I think it's either auto fiction or memoir. So it says, um, until a diagnosis of early onset menopause in her late twenties, she spent her life feeding insecurities and neuroses. I think it's, um, what do you call it? Memoir. Harriet spent much of her young life with obsessive internet searching, looking at exes, prospective partners, and even their exes, indulging in whirlwind parasocial relationships, but then suddenly staring, staring down years of IVF, HRT, and other invasive medical treatments. Her relationship with internet takes a darker turn as her online addictions throw into sharp relief by the corporal realities of illness and motherhood. Definitely sounds interesting to me. Definitely interested in how this is executed, but um, always keen to read about people's uh, relationship to the internet social media and sort of tackling the darkness of the world wide web so yeah that one's out in may and then i bought three more books but i've read two of them already so i don't feel so bad about that the ones i have read i found these for this one i found in streatham high street british heart foundation bookshop which is a great one to go into if you're ever in South London and looking for secondhand books. I got a copy of The Premonitions Bureau by Sam Knight. Me and Tom had an argument over the fact whether he's read this or not. Maybe he hasn't. I know my friend's boyfriend read it, so maybe I was like talking to him about it and I just, just muddled the men in my life together. But I read this as an early copy on my Kobu and then when I saw that there was a paperback in the shop for 2.50, I picked it up in case Tom had it read it and also because I wanted to definitely want to lend out to friends and it has amazing photography in it. I spoke about this earlier in the year and it will definitely be in my top 10 of the year, I think. So watch out for it there, but I'm happy to have a copy to add to my library. And then I picked up this one when we were in Margate. This is one of my favorite under underrated books about a cult. I read this maybe four years ago. It was definitely the year I first moved to Brighton. Yeah, it's gonna be four or five years ago then. And um, I rented it from the library and then I found this pristine edition, which I love the cover of because this, if you can see, this is like crinkle cut and then it's like this beautiful ribbed yellow underneath and it's in pristine condition. It was £3.20 and it's definitely one I want more people in my life to read. So I saw it in the charity shop for three twenty five. I thought I must own this and it's definitely one I probably would even reread. It's about a... Um, a, like all women led religious cult called the panacea society <clears throat> which was a real thing and then this is like a novelization of the experience of being in that cult and it's a lot about biblical womanhood um like cult-like tactics queerness um re like illicit relationships within church and yeah i just really enjoyed this one and i'm happy to have a copy of it especially one so beautiful and the final one is one I have not read but I am excited to read and couldn't believe my luck of finding this again at the Stratton British Heart Foundation for 350 a brand new looks like it's not even been read um hardback copy of Out of the Sun essays on the crossroads of air, of race um I put this I'm definitely sure in a radar video this is um Essays that look at seeking out the stories of black lives that history has failed to record. Five ranging essays written with the death of George Floyd and the rise of Black Lives Matter in the background. They reflect on her identity and experiences of the daughter of Ghanaian immigrants, the history of Western art and the truths about black, black lives that it fails to reveal. The ways contemporary black artists are reclaiming and reimagining those lives. She looks at the legacy of Afrofuturism, the complex and problematic practice of racial passing, presence of ghosts, haunting the imagination and the relationship between Africa and Asia from the sixth century. So yeah, definitely a wide ranging set of historical and modern contemporary thoughts, which I think will be really interesting, particularly on Afrofuturism. I know Tom will be interested in reading that one and it was 
so poignant to pick this up on and when we I was staying in Stratton with friends and then there was like an awful like crush that happened i'm not sure how much it, it made the mainstream news but we were in traffic sort of as it was happening in brixton high street outside the o2 there was an afro beats performer who was on his tour and there was a like a mass crush outside of um brixton academy and one person lost their life and i believe three more people remain in hospital and it was heavily policed and just totally mismanaged in terms of um people getting help and yeah it just was like super poignant to like be reading the first page of this as the news was coming in that that was happening and yeah definitely intrigued to continue with this one and I think that is all I have to show you oh no one cool thing that I picked up which um I'm not sure you can still buy these but this is look deeper zine once upon a crypt summer um my internet friend Ellie runs this really cool zine and I was lucky enough to contribute two pieces to um this um edition of the magazine it has really cool photo projects and it's like a very diy led crip community zine so if you are a zine collector or reader i wrote a review of and um gamble's poor little sick girls i wrote an essay about that and then i wrote an essay sort of about the nature of access needs and how non-disabled people have access needs they don't acknowledge or do acknowledge but don't view them in the context of disability liberation and really cool another internet friend did the like illustration drawing for it so just thought i put that in there if you don't follow ellie or look deeper on instagram i will link them down below and if you want to support a crypt collective of writers then this may be the one for you i've talked for far too long on this clip but i'll catch up with you with what i finished reading i think when i get back to amsterdam on sunday bye friends thought i would come back to sign off this video and give you one final reading update as you can see we're back in amsterdam getting ready for a very quiet christmas so um the first book i finished was strager by johan like Holm. and if i'm honest i was kind of disappointed i know this is like a very culty book on the areas of the internet i frequent and i think that's probably because of the aesthetics of it like it's a very beautiful naked hardback with this gorgeous lilac and green cover although i only had it in my bag for like a few days and it did get battered quite quickly it's an enjoyable story but for me the crescendo was ultimately quite lackluster um and it's definitely a weird book but the weirdness didn't necessarily like i don't know come to any kind of fruition i think i already spoke about the plot of this book it's about a group of girls who are like hotel wait staff and housekeepers in this abandoned like previously glorious hotel in a uh, like alpine town and then a murder takes place but it's not necessarily a traditional murder mystery in any means which i wasn't expecting but like it didn't have those tropes in it and it's very whimsical and a lot about ghosts and afterlives um which all of i can get on board with particularly this time of year but in the end didn't really love it like very middling for me so that is Strager. And then I continued to make progress on Jesus and John Wayne, how white evangelicals corrupted the faith and fractured a nation. I think I have like a third of this to go and I'm really enjoying it, particularly for reading when I've got like a longer stint of time to sit with it. Um, and yeah, realised very niche, probably not going to talk about it very much anymore until I wrap it up, but um, did enjoy that. I finished Raven Smith's Men. I had a good chat with my friend Siska about it. I wish I got to record that. Um, and I also lent her my physical copy of it, so I don't even have that to show you. But for the most part, I really enjoyed it. Raven Smith, for me, is quite similar to Samantha Irby, like, does what it says on the tin, know what I'm going to get when I pick up one of their essay collections, a mix between thoughtful and funny and irreverent and self-deprecating. There was one essay on Me Too in here, which I didn't, uh, like, find Raven Smith's take particularly fruitful I guess there was an interesting section in the essay where he talked about sort of the relationship between cis gay culture and me too and sort of the relationships of queer sex and how he was initiated into that scene as a young man and um the differences he felt between heteronormativity and 
the culture of gay hookups. But I think in the end, it felt very much like an apology letter slash a defense of previous unconsensual actions that he had participated in. And I just felt like, I didn't, I'm not going to villainize him for that. I just felt like he should have just said nothing at all, you know, and kept that in his private life. So that was the only gripe I had with that one. And then I ended up um, listening to on audio, I'm halfway through, and I think I'm going to pick up the rest tonight as the physical copy, When McKinsey Comes to Town, The Hidden Influence of the World's Most Powerful Consulting Firm. I spoke about this in a haul video, I think in my last, what I read this week, and I was really excited to read it, and it has not disappointed so far. It basically goes through each of the different firms and projects that McKinsey oversaw. Example, it's like influence within Chinese government, it's um, discussions with the FDA, Steelworks, um, and then the chapter I'm reading right now is all about Purdue Pharma, which if you've read out um, Empire of Pain by Patrick Ryan and Keith, you'll be well familiar with um, the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma. And McKinsey was an influential player in that and, um, of course, failed to take responsibility for the opioid crisis in the same way that the Sackler family haven't. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a a pretty savage undertaking from these two authors to go in on McKinsey like that and it's really interesting to look at the economic and sort of the the firm structure and had me contemplating this alongside conversation I've been having with friends recently about sort of the ethics of the jobs we do and the work that we undertake and sort of choice versus um yeah, like your moral compass and um, Mackenzie have quite an interesting structure in like the power to dissent, which is like the idea that they're like, quite a flat corporate structure in comparison to their counterparts. But obviously they do operate some kind of hierarchy, but they have this principle of like ev anyone can refuse work they don't want to do. Um, and it has this idea of like power to descend to speak out against something you find wrong. And then there's a chapter in here where they, Mackenzie start working with ICE, which is obviously like one of the most horrific federal organizations in the US they're responsible for deporting and um you know harming thousands of people every day in terms of refugees and people who are living who are born in other places and um, migrate to the US and there was a huge sort of revolt for a lot of the partners who were in some ways I guess products of social mobility they are in Mackenzie's firm but they did come from backgrounds that are not necessarily you would expect for such a highbrow industry and I think there's something to note about the structure of these consultancy firms and how they um I guess uphold the model minority in a lot of places because they handpick a lot of these students from big um Ivy Leagues who might be there on scholarship who they want to work they know will work really hard but they're not asking them to partake in actions that are like inherently against their own communities and I thought that chapter was particularly interesting but it's mostly about the failure of corporate responsibility and how everyone's fucking shit so depressing but like very gripping so far and then I just also the next novel I picked up I honestly haven't read that much I've only read 50 pages is Haunted Houses by Lynn Tillman this is a republished edition by Press Peninsula I believe it first came out in the 80s and it says it charts the girlhood and early adulthood of three sisters I believe but so far it's like feeling like quite a slog to get through and I'm not sure why I think because I've only been able to pick it up in maybe like 20 to 30 minute bursts it hasn't sorry if you can hear Tom sniffing in the background it annoys me as much as it annoys you um it's yeah I'm not sure about it so far like it's not I'm not enticed to pick it up but I do think I'll give it another 50 pages it is obviously an older book so therefore the writing stuff for me doesn't come so naturally when I read so yeah, that is what I'm reading right now. And then I have one more book to show you that was in my letterbox when I got back from, that like was here in Amsterdam. And this is Kayla by Colin Walsh. And it's one of the big titles that are um, Atlantic, are publishing. So Kirstie over Atlantic sent me a copy of this. It's a chunky boy and it's a like thriller crime, but like literary spin. And I, I do have a penchant for these kind of books sometimes. Like um, Lisa McNeary, who blurbs this book, wrote, writes um, an Irish crime family trilogy that I've read the first two of and loved. And um, yeah, this definitely sounds enticing to me. So I was excited to receive this in the post. Um, it's also set in Ireland and it says, um, in a seaside village, three old friends meet for the first time in years. They're 
They, Helen, Joe and Mush were part of an original six of inseparable teenagers in 2003 with motherless, reckless Kayla at its white hot centre. Later that year, Kayla disappeared without a trace. Now remains have been discovered in the woods and two more girls go missing. This estranged group are forced to confront their own complicity in the events that lead to Kayla's disappearance. Against the backdrop of a town suffocating on its own secrets, it examines the brutal cost of belonging, the battle of the human heart between vengeance and forgiveness. So like so many ticks on that one because it's published um, because it's an island and it deals with a mystery at its heart and um, a teenage friendship and betrayal. And I think it will be like quite a pacey read. And Tom and I, back there, are going on a family holiday in April that we're really excited about and it will be a lot of like lying around on a beach and reading and I definitely think I will take this with me because it's the kind of book I think I could devour over a couple of days. I think I'm going to try something new on that trip where I just bring like three really quite big books um, instead of like lots of little ones and see how I get on with that. So I think this is about 450 pages so let us see. It's out in July next year so I will be sure to remind you of it nearer the time. And I think... All in all, that is all I have to say on books this week or these past 10 days. I hope you enjoyed this vlog and seeing snippets of our trip back to England and there will be some end of year content coming up. I did record a, a like radar video that I just didn't edit. So let me know if you still want to see that. It's for like November and December, which I know is like pretty much past, but the recommendations still stand. So if I have time, I might edit that. And if you guys want it, then I'll put that up. And then we'll be back with end of the year lists and such um in january so i hope you guys will have a lovely christmas or just time off if you are not celebrating and get to relax and switch off which is what i'm doing i've deleted instagram and put my whatsapps on mute and i'm just gonna try and have a restful few days so i'll see you guys in the next one bye